it's not not too cold. Okay, so maybe we can start. So today we'll talk about uh, property T. Yeah, which is the, the second topic of, of these lectures. And this property is supposed to be like, well, the, um, it's the opposite behavior to, to amenability. Okay, so let us start with, uh, with definitions. Um, property T is defined uh, in terms of the first definition we see in terms of unitary representations of the group. So let me remind you that um, a unitary unitary representation representation Pi um, of a group of a group uh, gamma is a homomorphism morphism from gamma into unitary unitary um, Operators, operators, on some Hilbert space, space H. Okay, and uh, let us see um, an example of a unitary representation. Um, so called. Uh, left, left regular representation representation of gamma um, say what well, lambda is defined defined uh, as follows. So lambda uh, gamma at f of g, where f is any um, function in L2 of gamma, um, as follows. It's the translation of uh, the function by, by gamma. OK? So uh, the, the Hilbert space in this case is L2 of the group gamma. And uh, the homomorphism is, well, uh, these are translations, uh, left translations. OK, so it's, called, it's denoted usually uh, by Greek letter lambda. It's left, left representation. And similarly, one can define the right regular representation, which is usually, usually denoted um, by rho. So rho would be right regular representation. Um, OK. Of course, there is also another example is a um, trivial representation, identity. And although for um, many groups, um, it's a very uh, rich, there are many, many, many unitary representations. For groups, for instance, like free groups, F, F2, uh, one cannot classify all unitary representations. There are too many of them, 
But in general, I would say that uh, um, these are the only ones that one can uh, write explicitly. I mean, the regular representations and the um, and the and the trivial. And we'll we'll see already uh, some that uh, some interesting uh, facts can be deduced from the study of uh, of the left regular representation. So the left regular representation is, is an example of, um, of a unitary representation of a group, right? The L2 norm of the function is preserved under, under translations. OK, um, right. And now comes an interesting uh, definition, which is really the center. It's pointing to very, very important um, phenomenon. And it's at the heart of the well, definition of the property of the property T. Okay. And this, this um, although in the, the whole uh, class we, we're talking about discrete groups, okay, there is no, no topology, we're talking about countable groups. For this specific definition, I will, I will also state, in, uh, state more generally for um, locally compact groups. So apart from discrete groups, one should also think about, uh, about Lie groups for, for this definition. In a while, you'll see why uh, in this particular case, it's uh, interesting to, to include also, also Lie groups. OK, so the definition, which is due to well, Kashdan, So we'll say that um, unitary unitary representation pi um, almost has invariant vectors, almost has invariant invariant vectors. So this is that's a definition of almost having invariant vectors if um, for every positive epsilon and every uh, compact subset. Uh, and every, uh, maybe I'll write it, and every, and every compact subset k in uh, unitary representation pi of the group G, which is um, locally compact, that uh, for every compact subset k in this G, so if the group if the group is discrete, uh, compact means just well finite, and th that's what will be interesting uh, for us. Except one application, where well, we want to talk about also uh, Lie groups. Every compact uh, subset k, uh, there exists a vector in this. Hilbert space such that this vector is this vector is almost invariant, which means that the difference between V and its translation by any element in K, okay, that this difference, the norm of this, so this is for every K in this compact subset, this difference is uh, less than uh, epsilon times the norm of V. OK? So being invariant means that this difference would be 0, actually, for every K in the, in the, group, in the group G, but being um, 
almost invariant means that this difference will be less than epsilon okay for every for every k in this uh, in this compact or finite subset subset k okay and uh, immediately let me give you an uh, example which shows that uh, uh, the interest for this for this definition okay so example So let uh, gamma be an accountable amenable group. Okay. Um, and let let a n be a Fellner sequence. Okay. Um, then um, for um, then for well function for um, function vn being the characteristic function of a n one has one has that for um, one has for every for every uh, finite subset for every finite subset k in gamma if we look at lambda k vn minus vn okay by the definition of the Ferner set this divided by the norm of vn will tend to zero okay and here if you take, if we can take the maximum of this over all k's in k, okay? By by definition of the Ferner set, this will tend to zero. Therefore, for any fixed epsilon, okay, and for any fixed finite subset k, we can find n sufficiently large so that uh, for this v n. The, it, uh, this difference will be less than epsilon times the norm of v v n. Okay. Therefore, therefore, for gamma amenable, amenable, the left regular representation almost has invariant invariant vectors okay so um, in particular uh, for for integers which are amenable we know that as a Fellner sequence we could take a sequence of longer and longer intervals and therefore characteristic functions are uh, vectors which are more and more invariant Okay, and uh, so it's an example, the characteristic functions of long intervals of these vectors, which are, which can be um, most, ep ep uh, the, 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 uh, for which the, the difference of uh, these vectors and the translations is most epsilon uh, for any fixed, for any finite uh, fixed, fixed set. Okay, so we have, in this case, 
almost invariant vectors, representation almost has invariant vectors. However, there are no non-zero invariant vectors. Okay? For, for integers, uh, any, any function, any, any vector for uh, left regular representation, any uh, vector which is invariant corresponds to a constant function. And constant functions are never in L2 unless they, <coughs> unless they equal to zero. Right? And of course, it works for any, <coughs> uh, any infinite group. So uh, left regular representation for infinite groups doesn't have any non-zero invariant, invariant uh, vectors. <coughs> so for amenable groups, uh, we always say almost invariant vectors, but never unless they're finite uh, <coughs> invariant vectors, OK? So therefore, um, <coughs> and therefore, there is a big, we, you can see with this example, there is a big difference between having invariant vectors and almost having invariant, invariant uh, vectors. Can I write here? Yes? OK, so the definition, of the, so property T <coughs> exactly tells us the difference between, between uh, these two <coughs> two things. So a definition due to cash down. Um, it's 1967. So a group uh, G can be defined for any locally compact group has property T. If every unitary representation of G, which almost has invariant invariant vectors, in fact, has a non-trivial, has a non-zero non-zero invariant vector. Okay? So the only way to have uh, uh, <coughs> almost have to almost have invariant vectors is actually to have an invariant <coughs> an invariant um, an invariant uh, vector. Okay, and uh, so from uh, <coughs> from this example we can immediately deduce that uh, property T and amenability, these are disjoint properties, amenable property T, they are disjoint at least uh, for infinite groups. So uh, if, it, if a group is inf uh, amenable and has property T, it is necessarily finite. Actually, it requires uh, a little bit of thought. Why finite groups have property T? Okay, and uh, so I'll, I'll leave it to you details. But uh, well, if you have a finite uh, group, and if you have this vector which is almost invariant, okay, for uh, for K, you can take the whole group. How do you get an invariant vector? Well, you take the sum. You take the sum of translations of this vector by all elements in the group. Okay, in this way you get an invariant vector. Okay, and if you take this epsilon sufficiently small, um, you will also get a non non-zero non-zero uh, vector. Okay, so indeed. Uh, now uh, we understand uh, why these two uh, properties can be used to show that some groups are, are finite. Okay? As you remember, this was the, um, <coughs> th um, this property appeared 
um, at the first at the beginning of the of the first of the first lecture. Yes, there is also, and uh, f as far as uh, amenability is concerned, um, re re recent developments were really among uh, discrete countable groups. So that's why I didn't talk talk about this. But one could what could also define it, uh, taking into account uh, topology, and uh, then we would change the the or giving, for instance, the definition. With, uh, with mean, uh, it, this would be defined only for certain subsets, okay? But uh, for us, it will be, like, as far as uh, amenable is concerned, the, the only examples and statements we'll see are for, uh, for discrete, for countable, for countable groups. And in a while, it uh, will be clear uh, why I still want to uh, uh, want you to have in mind also the definition for uh, for Lie groups. With this argument, you gave both the compact. Right. Yeah. And then you get and with this def yeah you would get compact compact groups. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, that, but there will be only one point where we want to talk uh, about this. Uh, okay, maybe one thing that uh, I should uh, say is, well, wh why, why it's called property T? And actually T in parentheses. So T stands for the trivial uh, representation and on the, uh, on the space of unitary representation, uh, there is a topology called uh, Fell topology, okay? And um, in terms of this topolo topology, this property can be defined as a trivial representation being isolated among uh, irreducible uh, unitary representations. So that's why you have T which is isolated by this parenthesis. OK. Um, and you're saying that when you write property T, the brackets are important? I will tell you because we are at one reception. Right, so these are people who didn't understand uh, the <laughs> definition, yeah. OK, but now <laughs> you will always say your dissertation. Very good. Okay. Now you are experts. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me uh, explain you uh, a motivation for introducing this this property, and let me explain you the the problem uh, which was open for for many years and which was solved uh, using. Uh, using this property. OK, so I hope I can erase this. OK. If we consider uh, a group of uh, isometries of hyperbolic uh, plane, so SL to P L to R, um, and um, we consider uh, so-called lattice in this group, which, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. 
so let, let, let me explain, uh, yeah, maybe in the full, uh, oh, let me immediately give you the full generality. So the, the, the question that um, uh, Kajdan wanted to answer is the following one. If you take, uh, the question is about G, Lie group, Lie group and a lattice, which means, well, this, so lattice, which means um, it is discrete uh, subgroup of uh, finite covolume, so the volume of G mod gamma is, is finite, okay? Um, the volume de uh, defined using the Haar measure on the group, on the group, on the group G, and uh, um, he wanted to prove that some of this um, of these discrete groups are finitely generated. Okay, and the motivation uh, comes from the uh, from the group of isometries of the of the hyperbolic uh, plane. So in this case, if you take a lattice, this is a theorem uh, that goes back to Poincaré, and we all uh, seen uh, its proof um, in the topology class that gamma, in this, in this case, gamma is finitely, finitely generated, okay? And if you look at the action of gamma on the hyperbolic plane, so let H2 uh, be a hyperbolic plane, um, for its action you can find a fundamental domain, okay, fundamental domain, which, uh, which consists of um, finitely many, finitely many edges, and they correspond to uh, generators, and therefore these groups are finitely, uh, finitely generated. Okay, so um, this goes back uh, to Poincaré, and it was natural question: What happens in more general case? Uh, for actually, the question was stated for um, for other SLN Rs. What what happens for um, for other values of, of n? Okay, whether it's true that um, you can find, in this case also, you can find a fundamental domain with finitely, uh, with finitely many faces. Okay. So it seems to be a problem of geometric nature, okay, and uh, that's what it makes so interesting, that it was solved using a uh, property of unitary representations, okay, of the uh, of the group. Um, actually, um, so we will see that the solution to this problem is by showing that uh, such groups have property uh, have property T. Okay, so let me uh, let me uh, explain you this this amazing uh, this amazing proof. Okay, are there any questions? That you can find a fundamental domain so with this property. Yes, manifold. right. No, so it's like, so, so here it's like, um, okay, if you ask about manifolds, so this is clear if the, if the quotient is compact, then it is, uh, okay, then it's clear that it's finitely, finitely generated, okay? It's important, uh, it's, it's uh, not clear in the case when it has finite volume, yet it's not compact.
Okay. Right, so, um, okay, first theorem uh, in this paper of uh, Kajdan, which is very, uh, it's, it's really short, just a few, few pages. So let us prove that um, this relation between being finitely uh, generated and having property T, so a countable, countable group gamma, okay, L lattices this are discrete, are countable, a countable gr uh, group gamma with property T property T is finitely generated. Okay, why? So proof. So let us write the elements of the group gamma. Gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and so on. Okay, and let us consider a subgroup of gamma generated by the first n elements. So let, let, let us define gamma n as the group generated by the first n elements of, uh, of gamma. Okay? So now let us suppose that uh, gamma is not finitely generated and we want to find contradiction. Suppose gamma is not finitely generated. Okay. Um, then, well, gamma n is different from gamma, okay? And actually, it's not only different, but also it's of infinite index, okay? It's the subgroup of infinite, uh, if in infinite index, yeah? Because if the index of gamma n in gamma um, were finite, then one could add finitely many elements, okay? And then one would obtain to, to uh, <coughs> To, LM, to generators of gamma n, and then one could, would obtain generators for, for gamma. So for each n, it has to be, it has to be of, infinite, uh, of infinite index. Okay, great. So how do we find, um, how do we find the contradiction? Um, yeah, I could. I could try to finish the proof here, but uh, uh, or may maybe let, let me use this, okay. Okay, so how do we find the contradiction with, with uh, property T? So let us consider uh, as a Hilbert space, L2 of gamma modulo gamma n. Okay, so gamma n, um, it's not necessarily um, a normal subgroup. Okay, we just consider uh, equivalent uh, classes and gamma acts by left translations on this on the space of uh, of cosets, okay, and uh, it's again it's a unitary it's a unitary representation. Uh, we get a unitary representation of gamma on L two of gamma uh, modulo gamma n. Okay, uh, and uh, because 
gamma n is of infinite index, there is no no zero invariant vector, okay? Because gamma acts transitively on all these cosets, therefore an invariant vector is a constant function, okay? And it's it's not it cannot be in L two because there are infinitely many cosets unless it's zero, okay? So no uh, non-zero invariant vectors. Okay. But however, if we look at the function here, which is delta at the coset, which is identity gamma n, okay, this function is, uh, so it's a function which is zero on all cosets except the co coset which is identity, gamma n. So this function is invariant, invariant under, under gamma n. Okay, if we translate identity gamma n by any element in gamma n, we are again in the same coset. So this function is actually invar it's, uh, invariant under all elements in, uh, in gamma n. Therefore, if we take the direct sum of all the spaces, okay, again, we'll have no non-zero invariant vectors, okay, because of this. However, now for any for any finite uh, for any finite k, okay, this k uh, is included in some gamma n. So actually, for any finite k, we will find a vector, okay, this vector which is invariant by all elements in K. So here, uh, it's, it's, we don't have to take, well, epsilon can be as ar arbitrary small, yeah? It's, uh, we can find a vector which is actually invariant under K, okay? So for any finite K, in this case, we can find a vector which is invariant under K, but there is no vector which is invariant uh, by O gamma, okay? So contradiction. Okay, that's, that's it. Any group with property T, any countable group with property T is finitely, is necessarily finitely, uh, finitely uh, generated. Okay. What is interesting that this proof uh, doesn't uh, give you any, um, any information about the number of generators. All we know that it's, uh, that it's finitely, finitely generated. Okay, great. So we know that if we, if we prove that gamma has property T, then we solve this, uh, this problem that uh, the group is finitely uh, finitely generated, okay? So now we have to, how do you prove that such a group, okay, a lattice in SLNR for n at least three has, has property T? Okay, can, can I erase the definition? And this is the only place where uh, we, we'll <coughs> the definition for Lie groups, the definition of property T of Lie, for Lie groups, like SLNR, is uh, is relevant to us. Okay, so. Um, So a theorem, so a lattice in G uh, 
has T, if and only if, actually the Lie group uh, G has property T as well. Okay, and this is, uh, well, the, the proof of this, uh, of this fact, it's, it's really easy. I can leave you exercise at least this direction, which is interesting for us, that if G, the Lie group has property T, then actually the lattice has property T, okay? You have to induce a unitary representation uh, <coughs> uh, G from interpretation of, of gamma and, and use uh, property, uh, property T for, for G to deduce that you have, uh, if you had almost invariant vectors uh, for representation of gamma, you actually have uh, non-zero invariant invariant vector. Okay, but what is interesting that um, in general there is no, um, well, you, you cannot, well, you are in a situation that for a discrete groups, like, um, so an example of, of a lattice in SLN R, it's for instance, it's SLN Z, okay? Uh, SLN Z, it's an example of a lattice in, uh, SLNR. And for, for groups like SLNZ, you cannot classify all unitary representations. Okay? And it, it, it can be made as a very precise, uh, precise statement. Okay? However, for, for Lie groups, um, probably all seen classification of unitary representation for SL2R. Okay? There are families of unitary representations which can be uh, described. Uh, so for a Lie group, you can classify all unitary representations, okay? However, for, and for, uh, for lattices, you cannot do it in, in general. However, property T is inherited, okay? So um, as I'm saying, it's, it's, it's very simple, but uh, um, it's like it points to something uh, really deep that although in general there is no relation between unitary dual for a discrete group and uh, unitary dual for the, for the Lie group, still uh, property T, the fact whether uh, almost invariant implies invariant, can, uh, this can be read from the, uh, from the Lie group. Okay? That's, and th that's, um, it's interesting to consider also definition of property T for, for, for Lie groups, okay? And uh, because we don't have too much time in this class, so let me just say that for Lie groups like SL and R, you can classify all unitary representation. Actually, in the 60s, a lot of this theory was, was developed. So, and one can prove that SLN R has property T for N at least, at least uh, three, okay? And in this short paper uh, from 67, uh, th there is a proof, there is a proof of it. Okay, so this is, um, <coughs> that's, that, that's the theorem, that's, well, the, the proof that uh, using property T that these subgroups are finitely generated and uh, which made uh, this paper uh, so, so interesting and immediately it was realized that uh, uh, it's, it's a very important, interesting, interesting uh, property. What happened for real sets? So it's exactly known for which, uh, for which uh, which ones have property T. So certainly all with the real rank at least two have, uh, have this property. Okay, are, are there any other questions?
right, right, right. Right, yeah, yeah. So I, did, I didn't uh, dry this fell uh, topology. But, uh, um, okay, but, uh, so, so maybe let me m mention that, right, so it immediately, So it immediately follows that uh, quotient of a group with property T has property T. Okay. Also, uh, also that uh, finite index subgroups of a group with property T have property T. Okay. And uh, before we don't because we don't have too much time. So maybe let me actually finish uh, this lecture with uh, some. Um, some application which is not uh, not so trivial and uses the fact that uh, uh, finite index subgroups of groups with property T have property T. Okay, and uh, <coughs> then tomorrow we'll talk about expanders and uh, we'll see completely different application of property T really to this combinatorial problem of constructing highly connected highly connected graphs. Okay, but uh, right, so what, what we've seen that um, well, what we said that any uh, quotient of a group with property T has property T. Therefore, um, a group with property T cannot map on Z cannot have an infinite abelianization, okay? Um, so, well, the fact that a given group like um, SL3Z has finite abelianization, um, this will, it's, it's not uh, difficult, it's easy to compute uh, abelianization. However, um, we have this property not only for the group itself, but uh, for every finite index subgroup, okay? So if gamma has property T, then any finite uh, index, index subgroup of gamma has finite abelianization. Okay, and this was another um, another property that was uh, proven in the paper of of Kajdan. It doesn't sound so interesting. Okay, as this uh, as this proof that these groups are. Um, uh, finitely generated, I mean, this idea of using all unitary representation to, to show that you have finite set of generators, that this sounds something, um, um, so, something uh, completely new. Um, however, I would say that, well, whenever you have um, uh, give, uh, given group, um, it's not a difficult uh, problem to see if it's finitely generated, okay? Uh, the whole interest is here that it was actually also at the time when there was no classification of such uh, uh, such subgroups. Okay, that's it was before uh, Margulis arithmet arithmeticity theorem. Um, so you you proving this property for the well for the group you don't uh, yeah. I, you, you don't really know. However. This fact, um, it's really difficult to prove even for a, given, for a given group, okay? And I could give you many, uh, many examples of groups for which it's an open problem, okay? And uh, the one ma many people thought about, well, uh, so it seems that it's, 
in many cases it's the only way to prove that some groups have this property okay that there is no finite index subgroup that maps onto uh, onto z so it's interesting that um, somehow with uh, with time you well there are the diff different uh, things you you can appreciate more different applications of uh, of cash dance cash dance uh, property property t okay so i will let you to think uh, contemplate this this fact and uh, tomorrow we'll talk about a uh, completely different application of property t of how to give explicit examples of uh, of expanders okay thank you very much Right. So, um, um, we said that we wanted to somehow to divide the, the world of, uh, of infinite groups into groups which are amenable and, and property T. Well, the example were, uh, of a group which is non-amenable and which doesn't have property T, well, it's, for instance, F2, okay? Free group, okay? Why? Uh, well, we've seen it's non-amenable. Why it doesn't have property T? Well, it maps onto Z. It has infinite abelianization, okay? And fortunately, free groups don't have property T because every quotient, yeah, of a group uh, has property T. Okay, and uh, along these two properties, amenability and, and property, there were other, uh, other like kind of possible generalization. So the way uh, to extend definition of amenable to include F2 is to use uh, Hagar property, for instance. But, and, but again, it's not true that uh, uh, you, you would get some kind of division into two classes around so property T. Right, so ag again, there are, and even there is a, um, um, okay, and another, well, <coughs> so here we mentioned way of generalizing amenability. Um, we can also generalize property T. Uh, well, we can talk about relative property T for, for pairs of groups, okay? You have H and, and G, and for such a pair, we will say that it has relative property T. If whenever we have a unitary representation of G, which almost has invariant uh, vectors, it has non-zero invariant vectors by, by H. And, uh, and uh, right. Uh, and again, you can give examples which do not have uh, Hager property uh, um, and which do not have uh, relative property T with infinite, uh, with infinite H. And, uh, but somehow the, these two kind of uh, behaviors are amenability and property T. Well, tomorrow we'll see more applications of this property T. They are so important that um, there are many generalizations of, of these two uh, behaviors that were investigated. But in this short class, we'll concentrate only on amenability and, and property T.